Hello again, Black Knight Scholars. Mr. Deegan here with another edition of VidNotes videos. We're on to Unit 4, Lesson 2. We're continuing to study the era of revolutions, and this time we're talking about the age of absolutism, the age when absolute power is given to men and women who wear these. What is absolutism? Well, it's a political theory which argues that one person holds all power. The argument is that one person making all the decisions is better than many different people who are voting and making decisions for a government. Our guiding question for today is, what is the best way to govern? Is an absolute monarchy the best way, or are other options better? Let's explore. We have to ask ourselves, should you have a powerful central government that has most of the control, a government that might sit in this seat? Or is a good government one that divides power and has more voices with different branches of government? So again, let's explore the best way to govern. When was this age of absolutism? It goes from about 1550 to 1800. Absolute monarchs, monarchs being kings and queens, they have two major traits. First, they used the centralization of power to their benefit. Centralization means the combination and consolidation of power into one person, as you see in this image. Absolute monarchs also ruled by claiming divine right. These monarchs claimed that they spoke the word of God and that God spoke to them. It's hard to argue with a ruler who says God is speaking directly to them. And that's what these monarchs told their people. We're going to study two absolute monarchs today. We've already talked about the English King Henry VIII, who had those six wives. Now we're going to talk about Louis the XIV means 14, so Louis the 14th of France. Here he is in his decorative outfit. And to his right, we have Peter the Great of Russia. And you see his armor and his instrument and robe there. So the French Empire is ruled by this man and the empire of Russia further east is ruled by this man. Let's first study and explore Louis XIV of France. He ruled France from 1643 until 1715, making him a ruler for 72 years in France. In fact, he is the 11th longest reign in history. Louis XIV gave himself the nickname Sun King, and he chose the sun as his logo. This is the logo that he had decorated on his palace that we're about to talk about. Why the Sun King? Well, the sun was a heavenly body that gives life to all things, and Louis XIV had a huge ego. He thought the world revolved around him, just like the sun. He also said, I am the state. I am the government. One person is enough. This is one of his famous phrases. Did the people of France like Louis the 14th? Well, it depends on who you were in France. He was aggressive when it came to foreign policy. He won a lot of land for France by building France a strong military. He also built a strong economy by eliminating the national trade deficit and providing jobs 
for the French people. However, he favored Catholics over other kinds of Christians. He himself was a Catholic. So Louis XIV ripped up the Edict of Nantes that was decided on during the Protestant Reformation, and he told the French Huguenots, who were Protestants that were practicing their religion in France, he told them that their religion was invalid. Oh, sorry, you can't practice this religion anymore in France. Religious tolerance is no more. So if you're a Catholic, you might like this, you might not care. If you're a Protestant in France, you are leaving the country immediately because you might die. How did Louis XIV centralize the government in France? Well, first, he ended feudalism. And what is feudalism? You might remember from World History One that feudalism is a social class system in Europe with the kings at the top, with the nobles right below, the knights, and then the peasants on the bottom. Well, he brought all of the nobles in France who were powerful political leaders to his palace to live in order for him to keep an eye on them. What a clever thing for Louis XIV to do. And he needed to keep an eye on these nobles because they tended to be rebellious. In fact, in the 40 years before Louis XIV started to rule, these nobles started 11 different civil wars. And the nobles lived with Louis XIV in this palace of Versailles, which was located just south of the city of Paris, France. You see the interior. Look at how ornately and fancily decorated it is. Lots of gold. You see the outside of the Palace of Versailles as well. There were more than 14,000 different fountains. How many people built this? 35,000 laborers helped build the Palace of Versailles. It took 50 years to build this massive palace. And it was a symbol of Louis XIV's absolute power. If you have a mansion that big, you're important. That was Louis XIV's mindset. From France to Russia, from Louis XIV to Peter the Great. Peter the Great, pictured here in his younger years, he was the czar of Russia. Czar is a Russian word that literally means Caesar, but it refers to ruler. And Peter the Great was born with this name, I'm going to attempt to pronounce it, Pyotr Alexievich Romanov. And he was a ruler in Russia for about 40 years. Not as long as Louis XIV, but a 40-year reign is a long time to rule. In fact, he took the throne at age 10, at the ripe old age of 1-0, and he grew to be 6 foot 8, a tall ruler indeed. How did Peter the Great modernize Russia? We're studying him as an example because he brought Russia from the Dark Ages, from isolation, to a place of modernization. He opened Russia up to the world. And how did he do that? A few different ways. First, he improved education. He simplified the complicated Russian alphabet, and he set up academies to study math, science, and engineering. Peter the Great also practiced mercantilist policies. Remember mercantilism having to do with trading? He encouraged the exports of goods to different countries in Asia and Western Europe, and he traded readily with them. In short, he ended Russian isolationism. He thought it was better for Russia to be interacting with other cultures and other economies. Lastly, he also created a strong navy within Russia. He was able to build the Russian Empire and gain land. And you see evidence of that in the painting that he chose to have painted for him. You see a ship over his left shoulder, and you see armor 
which shows his military strength. And the ship would show his willing to explore and navigate and trade. How did Peter the Great westernize Russia? Westernize meaning making it more like Western Europe. Well, he did it using a road trip. He spent two years traveling around Western Europe in disguise. And here is a painting of Peter's disguise. He changed his name. He stuck with the name Peter, but he used Mikhailov as his last name. And he traveled with an entourage of 200 courtiers, trumpeters, and court dwarves. That's right, dwarves, small people. And how did they pay for rent in the various places they stayed at? Well, they used diamonds. No big deal. Just diamonds. And when he came back from his two years traveling, he changed Russia. He said, gentlemen, you must cut your beards. And if you refuse to cut your beards, you must pay a tax on it, a beard tax. He said, women, you must remove your veils. And he encouraged women to wear lower cut French style dresses. In addition to changing fashion, Peter the Great changed Russian calendars. He made it more like a European Julian calendar. He also replaced long coats with European pants. He ended arranged marriages in Russia, which you would think would be a good thing, allowing people to love who they want to love rather than who their parents want them to be set up with. He opened Western schools. We talked about that before, improving education. He also brought the first potatoes to Russia. Potatoes, a really easy crop to grow, a crop that helps out a country's diet and prevents poverty. That's how Peter the Great westernized Russia. We are almost done. Ladies and gentlemen, we have but the summary questions remaining. Please pause the video and put the information you've learned together in these questions. And now a preview. Next lesson, lesson three, we'll be talking about the Enlightenment thinkers and their ideas. How did they change the way we look at government? The third lesson has answers. Until that lesson, this is Mr. Deegan, signing off.